We have three esteemed guests that are here today, uh, all of whom have crossed paths diplomatically. And this is the element of our discussion today. We'll talk about U.S.-Belarus relations and U.S.-Belarusian rapprochement, which is titled the panel. Uh, none other, we're very uh, glad to have with us today Deputy Assistant Secretary of State uh, for European and Eurasian Bureau Affairs, uh, the Honorable George Kent, uh, who will be speaking today. And uh, so we're very happy that he made time out of his very busy schedule uh, to be able to be with us and to share his thoughts on the, this important topic. Um, the second person who will be speaking will be Oleg Kravchenka, who is a Deputy Foreign Minister of Belarus who served here in Washington for many, many years. Uh, he has a very uh, distinguished background and PhD in international law uh, from the Institute of Philosophy. He has uh, served in several different diplomatic posts, but he has a, the most important position now being Deputy Foreign Minister. Um, so he's very well known here in the corridors of Washington, D.C. Uh, our third speaker will be uh, none other than uh, retired General Ben Hodges, who many of you know, uh, is quite familiar. Ben Hodges is uh, former commanding general U.S. Army Europe. He is now uh, Pershing Chair at Center for European Policy Analysis, SIPA, and is the author of a new report on the Baltic Black Sea region, uh, which he will talk about briefly. Uh, and I'm very proud of the fact that uh, Gerald Hodges, uh, who wanted to travel to Belarus when he was in service, uh, finally got his chance to when Jamestown led a delegation there in November of 2018. Uh, and he added a very important piece to his uh, uh, battlefield um, collection uh, that he'll tell you about of when he went to the Berezina River in, in uh, Belarus where Napoleon made his great escape. So on that note, uh, and I'd like to know that uh, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary Kent's comments are off the record, uh, so please do not uh, make your, his remarks attributable today. Um, and sir, we will turn the flow over to you. George, thank you for coming. Uh, thank you, Glenn and Jamestown Foundation, and it's my honor to be on stage with both Oleg and Ben, uh, colleagues, as, as Glenn said, that uh, we've all interacted in a variety of, of places and, and uh, uh, panels. Uh, U.S. policy, I would say, has towards Belarus has two fundamental pillars, uh, and we can break them down geostrategically and in terms of democratic development. Geostrategically, the U.S. supports Belarus sovereignty and independence, particularly in the face of Russian pressure to conclude the unrealized Union Treaty, which I know the previous panel was talking about. In terms of democratic development, the Belarus Democracy Act, as passed by Congress and updated over the years, uh, acts, as Wes Mitchell uh, often said, as the guardrails of our relations. Uh, and I'll say a little bit more about each of these two baskets and then uh, where we are uh, post-renewal uh, of, the, of the parliament. Uh, I think any of the Westerners who have been to Minsk this year has felt uh, the change of seasons. That's the fall, the, the seasons change several times a year, but uh, 2019 seemed to have a, a different feel than in previous uh, years and cycles of Russian pressure over the expiration of contracts and uh, discussions about the relationship going forward. Uh, the pace of negotiations uh, certainly sounds and feels much fiercer ministers, particularly on the economic side, uh, who would have more time to engage the EBRD and other interlocutors um, uh, mid-year were spending nearly all of their time negotiating with Russian counterparts. But this year, it doesn't appear uh, that this is just about favorable tax and customs treatment of oil and other energy products. It does seem to be about the very uh, sovereignty and independence of Belarus in the face of at least Russia's stated desire to complete the unrealized political union. In the aftermath of Russia's occupation of Crimea and its ongoing war in eastern Ukraine, it's been our impression that Belarus's world view appears to have shifted. I don't know if I'll go as far as Vlad would about you know, paving the way for a non-aligned status. I'll let uh, the Deputy Foreign Minister talk about that. But I think it's notable that Minsk never recognized the attempted annexation of Crimea by Russia. Uh, and I think President Lukashenko is very proud of that fact and certainly mentions it every time he meets us. Uh, it has been the venue for the uh, frustrating uh, Minsk process conversation. Um, and uh, I think a number of people here attended the Minsk Forum Dialogue, which has become a venue the last several years for experts and policymakers to meet and discuss issues. Again, from the U.S.'s perspective, we support Belarus's right to pursue its own path. 
Uh, that means we don't question its choices uh, as to whom, uh, with whom it uh, makes uh, security arrangements. That's our attitude towards Armenia uh, as well. Uh, and Belarus should have the right to determine the nature of its relationship with Russia on its own terms, not on Moscow's terms. Uh, for the part of the US, Under Secretary Hale and I were there in mid-September. Uh, within a span of three weeks, we had the two highest US delegations to Belarus in 25 years. That was uh, former National Security Advisor Bolton and then Under Secretary Hale. And Under Secretary Hale announced uh, that we would be returning ambassadors for the first time since 2008. It wasn't our choice to lose our ambassador in Belarus. That was the choice of President Lukashenko. But that was 11 years ago, and our relationship is in a different place. Um, and uh, that is a sign that we are prepared to engage uh, Belarus uh, more intensively. We will have a larger embassy staff. Uh, we're looking for a place where we can build a proper embassy. Uh, and at the same time, we're not asking or expecting Belarus to choose between East or West. We are engaging Belarus uh, on its own terms. And that is, I think, very much part uh, of the uh, national security strategy of the Trump administration, uh, the, the, uh, the European portion of which was written by Wes Mitchell. And in there, we uh, are uh, stating forthrightly that we will compete for positive influence and not take countries for granted. And as Undersecretary Hale said in mid-September when he was in Minsk, uh, we look forward to deepening our relations with Belarus in areas where our interests coincide, such as non-proliferation, border security, trade, investment, and energy. Now, he made clear in both our meeting with President Lukashenko and then our meeting afterwards with representatives of civil society and uh, opposition groups that in order to re, uh, reach the full potential of the bilateral relationship, Belarus would need to demonstrate progress on expanding space for civil society and alternative political views. Uh, that, in turn, would allow us to expand elements of the relationship which are currently constrained by the terms, including sanctions, imposed pursuant to the Belarus Democracy Act. It is our belief, and I've been to Minsk three times this year and stated it both to government colleagues like Oleg and, and when we've met people outside government, that such steps are in Belarus's own interest. Uh, the best hedge for Belarus's independence vis-a-vis uh, -vis negotiating with Moscow is not what American diplomats or Europeans think. It is the Belarusian people themselves and Belarusian society. That is the hedge against Russian encroachment and some sort of great Russian identity. Um, it also would lead to a more successful Belarus economically and socially. So in that regard, um, uh, it is our belief that Belarus missed an opportunity with the recent parliamentary renewal process. The last sitting of parliament had two independent voices that were described as opposition, uh, but I think anyone who ever talked to them understood them as uh, constructive voices uh, and not uh, opposition in the normal sense of political opposition. Um, one of whom made the use of the Belarusian language her uh, focus and cause. Unfortunately, both were disqualified from running for re-election, and no similar figures that could be described as opposition made it into the new parliament. The International Observer Missions, the OSC ODIR, the OSC Parliamentary Assembly, and Council of Europe openly assessed their concerns regarding the conduct and outcome of last week's process and the opposition, the absence of opposition forces in parliament. As part of the US government, which aligned itself with those concerns, we will continue to encourage the government of Belarus to reform its election law and processes in line with the recommendations. So where does this leave us um, on uh, November 21st, uh, 2019? Uh, the US is realistic about the current limits of our bilateral relationship, but we will also continue in good faith to explore how we might be able to move beyond them step by step. We will engage with Belarus and officials like Oleg to identify areas where our interests and cooperations uh, can both coincide and benefit both countries. Uh, sometime in the next year, we will, with the advice and consent of the US Senate, send an ambassador to Minsk. Uh, we will, as I mentioned before, gradually increase the size of our diplomatic presence, laying the foundation for a broader and deeper cooperation in areas where our interests coincide. Uh, all of that is just diplomatic infrastructure, however. So to truly make more of this renewed relationship, we must put that sort of diplomatic infrastructure to work to make the people of our two countries safer, freer, and more prosperous. 
and that will remain our strategic policy and operational focus. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Minister. Thank you. Assistant Secretary Kent, General Hodges, President Howard, ladies and gentlemen. Let me start by thanking the Jamestown Foundation for the initiative and organization of this timely discussion. The topic of this panel is U.S.-Belarusian relations and rapprochement. Glenn also said we would be discussing Belarus's balancing between the East and the West, so I will cover these two topics in my introductory statement, and then we'll be ready to answer your questions. And I'd like to start with some considerations of mine regarding the balancing topic. In order to understand how to approach it, I looked up what exactly balancing is. In general sense, it's being in a position where you stand without falling to either side or given several things, equal amounts of importance, time, or money, so that a situation is successful. In international relations, balancing derives from the balance of power theory. Mostly external balancing is understood as forming counter-alliances. So I would like to challenge the very suggestion that we are balancing. I believe it is supposed by all that we are balancing between Russia and the West. I don't think we are trying to stand without falling to either side. Is there a realistic chance for us to fall to the Western side? I don't think it looks like we are giving Russia and the West equal amount of importance, time, and effort to develop relationships. It is simply impossible given the track record of our relations with the West and the current state of affairs. For 20 out of 28 years of our independence, relationship with the West was a troubled one, to put it mildly. There is definitely negative inertia, hurt feelings, unrealized expectations. There are still differences and disagreements. We are not trying to form or join an alliance to counter Russia. We are in a political military alliance with Russia, and this alliance is seen by many as anti-Western. But we don't really see much desire in the West to influence Belarus. So our being in the alliance is not about countering a rising power that has a potential to, in any way, subdue our country. We are interested in expanding our very modest context with the NATO. Absolutely not to counterpose that to our alliance with Russia and not to even counterbalance that. More contacts are needed for better communication, for minimizing risk of small incidents due to lack of communication that may rapidly escalate for cooperation in apolitical spheres like emergencies preparedness. Starting from 2011, Belarus was a partner of the NATO within the Northern Distribution Network, providing our territory for railroad transit of cargo for ISAF, mostly US troops in Afghanistan. This cooperation started soon after the US introduced new sanctions. We made a deliberate decision to go ahead with the NDN to demonstrate that despite political atmospherics, we will be a partner when it comes to strategically important matters of international security. Bilaterally, we have been developing male-to-male -male contacts with our NATO neighbors, and beyond that, with the US, Great Britain, Germany. When it comes to the NATO itself, a security agreement is still not operational. Because of that, 12 out of 19 agreed priorities of Belarus-NATO cooperation cannot be implemented. <laughs> I would like to commend the U.S. charge in Minsk, Jen Moore, for her initiative to reach out to Belarusian authorities and provide us in advance with information on the U.S. troops and military equipment placed less than 10 miles to Belarusian border and the upcoming Defender 2020 exercise. We definitely disagree on the necessity for these measures, especially given the current already existing tensions in the region. But that will hardly change the US and NATO plans. So just, so just as Belarus ensured transparency in the run-up and during the Zappa 2017 exercise, we expect the US and the NATO to be transparent. We'll have to react to this new US military presence in the immediate vicinity of Belarus. At the same time, as Mr. Zas, State Secretary of the Belarus Security Council, said after the meeting with Jan Moore, Belarus is ready to adjust, to adjust her reaction plans. These American tanks near our border and the Defender 2020 exercise 
meant to check on mobility of U.S. troops and military equipment from forts to ports in the U.S. and then to ports in Europe will definitely be seen by many as a very worrying sign of further escalation of tensions, to put it mildly. So I believe it is time for the NATO to certify a cooperation agreement with Belarus, which would contribute to confidence building between us and going through another exercise in the neighborhood as calmly as possible. In view of the INF Treaty termination, Belarus President Alexander Lukashenko stated that Belarus would continue to observe the INF obligations by not producing or deploying in her territory missiles under the INF Treaty. We hope other European countries will join us in committing to that. <laughs> I believe a meeting of national security advisors of Belarus, Ukraine, Poland, and the US in Warsaw in late August was also a needed conversation on security challenges globally, but more importantly, regionally. Was it in any way a part of an alleged balancing by Belarus? I don't think so. You have to talk to your neighbors, no matter what political military alliances they belong to or want to join. And it doesn't always have to take an American national security advisor to have this neighborly exchange. So I'm glad that a bilateral meeting of heads of Belarus Security Council and Polish National Security Bureau was held recently in Belarus. We are a member of the Eurasian Economic Union, and we would like to have a better relationship with another trade bloc, the EU, which is our trade partner number two. Is this balancing, is this potentially harmful to the Eurasian Economic Union? Hardly. It's again only natural to want a normal relationship with an immediate neighbor. So how come it is still impossible to even start negotiation on the partnership and cooperation agreement between Belarus and the EU? We have been calling for that for years now. And the EU has these agreements with all neighboring countries in the region, except for Belarus and it doesn't make sense. I'd like to make it very clear, Belarus doesn't have an aspiration for EU membership or European perspective. Even countries that really strive for that are not given European perspective. All we want strategically in the long term is to be good neighbors. But often it seems that the EU applies to us same requirements that are applied to candidates and aspirants. Again, don't misunderstand me. I didn't mean to complain about lack of US, EU, or NATO steps towards Belarus. The right achievements and there is progress. We have normalized the relationship. The majority of sanctions have been lifted. We are close to signing visa facilitation and readmission agreements. With the US, an important decision to return ambassadors has been made. This progress is significant given the record of our disagreements. But it would be a mistake to think that the West is providing Belarus with possibilities to use balancing to counter Russia. And most importantly, that Belarus is trying or willing to do that. In my view, talk about balancing also reveals a systemic problem. Position of countries comparable to Belarus are more and more seen through the prism of geopolitical confrontation between major actors. A smaller state is supposed to bandwagon and not to even have her own interests. And this interest may be in working with both actors without choosing one over or against the other. A couple of words on Belarus-US relationship per se. It's been improving, the right achievements. I just mentioned a decision to return ambassadors. But we shouldn't forget the very low base from which this improvement started. We haven't had ambassadors in our respective capitals from 2008. We have had very limited contacts for even longer. What's happening in our relationship right now is, in my view, a process of returning to normalcy. It didn't start during the current administration. It didn't start in 2014. It started even earlier than that. So it's a rather slow process. This process is not without difficulties. The International Election Observation Mission's conclusions on the parliamentary election in Belarus represents one of those disagreements. Is this a negative factor for our relationship with the US? Unfortunately, it is. Was such conclusion by the OSCE, ODIR, OSCE, PA, and the Council of Europe Observation Mission 
unexpected? Unfortunately not. And we disagree with this um, assessment. There has been a statement by the Belarus Foreign Ministry, so there is no need to repeat it. But let me share with you some additional considerations of mine. OSCE ODIR is a respected body with top-notch lawyers working on election observation conclusions. But the conclusions are not just purely legalistic evaluation based on a crystal clear set of criteria and, so to speak, boxes you have to check or uncheck. Everything in the conclusions is important. But the most important part is this one sentence out of a lengthy text that is basically a verdict for an election, being recognized as democratic or not, meeting international standards or failing to do that. If you read conclusions on several countries' elections, you may see that sometimes a great deal of criticism throughout the text does not lead to a negative verdict. Sometimes it does. So there are some political elements, not necessarily in a negative ideological sense, involved too. Why conclusions of the CIS observation mission are so different from the OSCE Council of Europe conclusions? Would anyone dare to say all observers in the CIS mission are unprofessional or even worse, corrupt, somehow bought by us? I seriously doubt it. And I look forward to further working with the OSCE ODIR and other international stakeholders to bring our positions closer. When I see headlines or comments like, opposition wins no seats in the parliament, I can't help but think that many look at our election as if it was a proportional system election. Our system is majority. No party lists closed or open. No parties running to represent a national political force in the parliament. Individual candidates run in single mandate districts. Some of them obviously work for the government or local authorities, the military, educational or healthcare system. They are largely seen as pro-governmental. Other candidates are linked to political parties or public organizations. Some of them support the policies of the government, some oppose them. But still, as usually in a majority system, it's more about the biography, education, position, visibility, and reputation of a candidate rather than his or her party affiliation, which is also a factor, but not a decisive one. Political parties develop significantly more in a proportional system. So in a majority system, in a single mandate district, a well-known person in a certain position, be it local authorities or healthcare or education, objectively has an advantage over a candidate who mostly does political party work. And I'm not suggesting this is not important, but the proportional system is not really conducive to strengthening the role of political parties in elections. In the US Department of State statement, there is criticism that there have been no meaningful changes to the electoral process as recommended by the OSCE. So I will be ready to have uh, an exchange on that based on US's and some other OSCE countries' own experience of implementing OSCE or their recommendations. Thank you. Ben? So, uh, once again, Jamestown uh, has given me an opportunity to learn about Belarus. Uh, Glenn, I'm very grateful for that. And to be on a panel with uh, one of America's uh, best diplomats um, who I've seen in action for a very long time. And um, you never got the job in the Bahamas or anything like that. It's always been, <laughs> uh, That's vacation. That's not work. <laughs> so, uh, George, we're all very proud of you. And then, of course, uh, Oleg, uh, a great uh, diplomat who uh, helps explain Belarus, but also you probably have to do a lot of explaining about America uh, as well. <laughs> Back the other direction. So um, I did notice out in the audience, uh, my Lithuanian minders are here, my uh, SEPA teammates, um, who are always worried that I am too, uh, perhaps, naive. So they're here to check on me and, uh, and, and make sure I don't go too far. Milda, I won't say your name and give you away, don't worry. Um, <laughs> I think when we're talking about something, a subject, 
like Belarus, uh, you have to, I mean, of course there's gonna be multiple facets and, and uh, there's a best case and worst case and, and then figuring out how, how do we normalize uh, the relationship? How do we achieve um, strategic objectives that we all want, uh, which of course really is tied to stability and security in Europe and, uh, and prosperity for everybody that lives there. So that, I, like, I like the tension, the, the healthy tension. Now, um, some of you probably saw the video that um, Oleg sent out, uh, I think it was last week. It was a, a Belarus rap uh, on YouTube. It, it's hilarious. Fortunately, it had English subtitles, uh, but the, uh, this gentleman, um, I'm sure he did, but it didn't make it through the firewall. It, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but th this thing is wonderful. It's a, it gives a little bit of a history of Belarus. It, it makes fun. It put the guys pointing to the map. Here's where we are, and and it brings in different civilians that are part of Belarus. Belarus on the on the refrain, and it's really funny. But what got my attention, I think, in the first 30 seconds of this thing, Belarus is laying claim to Kosciuszko. And of course, you know, all my Polish friends, you know, Kosciuszko obviously is Polish. He's this great Polish engineer. And then, of course, the uh, former deputy defense minister of Lithuania, our friend Yedrimus, uh, Yedrimus that all of you know, said, oh, wait a second, he's Lithuanian, you know, depending on what years you're talking about. So Kosciuszko is a great Lithuanian Polish engineer. And then I see in the, in the Belarus rap that Kosciuszko is actually from Belarus because where he was born, it is now Belarus. And so I, I think I can envision a, a project where the Kosciuszko uh, project is all about helping uh, this beautiful old part of Europe, historic part of Europe, is brought together by a Polish-Lithuanian-Belarusian engineer who was famous because he designed the defenses at West Point. And that's the only reason I know about him <laughs> um, is, is because he was a uh, professional engineer that helped us earn our independence. So thank, thanks for uh, Belarus's contribution to our independence. <laughs> um, Glenn's right. We did just release yesterday from SEPA our uh, interim report of something that shorthand we call it the B2 study, but it's about... Um, how, do you, how do you achieve coherence on NATO's eastern flank? Um, after the uh, Warsaw Summit in 2016, the alliance created enhanced forward presence for Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland, and then tailored forward presence for the Black Sea region. Now, there's political reasons and all kinds of other reasons that are not surprising to any of you who, who pay attention to NATO or any, any coalition. But the result was that the alliance did a lot to ensure effective deterrence in the northeastern part, but in the Black Sea region, which I would contend is actually more likely where a conflict might occur, uh, and is probably even more important to the Kremlin strategically than is the Baltic region, we, we don't have the same level of, uh, of deterrent effect there. Uh, and in fact, I, I sort of see a, a new iron curtain across the Black Sea where where Russia will not use force against uh, Romania, Bulgaria, or Turkey, but clearly they're using force every day against uh, Georgia with the occupation of 20% of Georgia, as well as uh, the illegal annexation of Crimea, the, the illegal claims that they've made to territorial waters and, and uh, economic exclusion zone in the Black Sea, and of course uh, their uh, support um, in the uh, in the Donbass. And, and of course, at the excellent Mintz dialogue that was uh, referred to uh, just a moment ago, uh, Yevgeny's uh, excellent, um, that really is a good event. But there was a very senior Russian official that was up on the stage, and, and the, the notion of, or somebody brought up the subject of the Steinmeier formula and the need, I think it was Ambassador Birchbaum, actually, and he said, you know, the problem with the Steinmeier formula is it doesn't tell you how to get from where we are now to having elections that would be fair, respected, because of all the Russian troops that are in Donetsk. And this very senior Russian official on the stage says, well, we would be happy to withdraw them except there are no Russian troops there. So the, the fact that a senior Russian official in public can stand up there and just say this uh, total fairy tale uh, gives you a little bit of a sense of the, of the challenge that we have if we're gonna get to a, a settlement um, that um, is not a giveaway of Ukrainian sovereignty. But I think Belarus 
plays a, a, a can play a, a critical role here, not just in offering a great place for meetings, but actually because of where it sits on the map. And so back to our B2 study, as we looked at coherence on NATO's eastern flank, I mean, all of you know exactly where Belarus is. I mean, but for me, until Jamestown finally let me uh, enter uh, Belarusian airspace um, <laughs> on, on uh, U.S. defense maps, it's just a big black hole. We don't know anything about it. But yet it touches Polish border, Lithuanian border, part of the Latvian border, and a big chunk of the Ukrainian border. It's to the advantage of everybody that Belarus is able to however it's happening, to demonstrate enough uh, independence that there are no Russian ground troops stationed in Belarus. I don't, I don't think that makes me naive, but that's what we would all want. I mean, certainly if I lived in Lithuania or Poland, I would be glad that there are no Russian ground troops that have their barracks, their training area, all their maintenance facilities living in Belarus. That's, the, that's our advantage. Um, now, if, in my estimate of looking at time distance factors and you know, on various exercises we've looked at, if the Kremlin decided um, that they were going to do something in this region, uh, of course, uh, they could move quickly, depending on whether or not Belarus resisted or uh, facilitated or just stood by. They could close that gap pretty fast. But at least it gives us time to be able to recognize and anticipate and see what's happening. So that's, for me, strategically, um, a normalization of relationships with, with Belarus that doesn't pull them across one of the red lines that uh, Vlad spoke about so eloquently earlier. And so that President Lukashenko is able to continue saying, as I heard him say back in November last year, to a, a row of TV cameras, thank you very much to uh, Moscow, but we can defend ourselves. We don't need Russian troops here to help us defend ourselves. I, I thought that was a powerful statement. Now, of course, he's doing what every national leader has to do is you're having to deal with all your neighbors. So I, I'm not uh, totally naive, but I thought that was an important statement. And then just a few weeks ago, when uh, after the announcement about the uh, U.S. Army Rotational Battalion that's going to live in uh, Lithuania now for about nine months as part of the normal Rotational Brigade, which is usually based in Poland, now one of the battalions is going to live in Lithuania. Twenty tanks. I mean, you could pretty much park 20 tanks on uh, a high school football field. We, we could not invade Luxembourg with 20 tanks. The Kremlin is like, oh my God, we're going to have to respond to this huge threat to our sovereignty. President Lukashenko said, 20 tanks, that's no threat to anybody. I mean, he, I think he, in Belarusian, he probably said they could put them all on a football field. Uh, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> or inside hockey a hockey ring. ring. Okay. <laughs> so the point is, the fact that he didn't overreact and use the usual uh, Kremlin sort of uh, fairy tale that here we go again, the West is threatening everybody. He, he described it exactly what it was, 20 tanks. So to, to, I think that kind of perspective shows a, uh, a responsible, uh, helpful uh, sort of attitude. Now, um, I, did, I tried to get into Belarus the whole three years. I was uh, First the two years, I was the commander of NATO's land command in Izmir, and then when I was a commander of U.S. Army Europe from 14 to 17, because I had this big, gigantic black hole on my map that I didn't know what the heck was going on in there. I mean, I'd heard of Belarus, but I, I didn't know anything about it. And I was told repeatedly by the State Department and the Department of Defense, hell no, you're not going there. We're not going to reward bad behavior with a high-level visit. First, I was thrilled that somebody in the U.S. government thought I was at a high level. That's <laughs> uh, only my mother. Only my mother had thought I was actually at a high level uh, uh, prior to that. But it also reflected, I thought, a very short-sighted, um, attitude. I mean, what, it, what a, um, nobody's going to confuse, excuse me, President Lukashenko with Thomas Jefferson. I, that's, that's not the point. The, the point is, how can we have relations with a, with a country um, that is in a very, very important place? And uh, so, 
anyway, I finally uh, got to go there. And I think Wes Mitchell going in obviously opened the door. Um, and also, I think right before that, uh, Wolfgang Ischinger and the Immunity Security Conference core meeting was held in Minsk. Also, I, again, another important symbol. And then uh, Oleg it was, uh, uh, gave us a real treat. We went to the Bergina River, which, of course, as Glenn mentioned, this is where Napoleon on the disastrous retreat out of uh, Russia, where they had to cross a river. And uh, it was an incredible engineering feat. I mean, if you can imagine in uh, freezing cold weather, freezing water, uh, engineers out there uh, in the early uh, 18, 1810 um, on this retreat, uh, 1812, they are out there um, in the water building this bridge. All the engineers were Dutch, by the way. Almost all of them died. The rear guard was made up of Swiss troops. I had no idea that Napoleon's force was such a multi He even had Spaniards in his, in his uh, formation, Lithuanians and, and various others. But there's a huge monument there to, to the soldiers, the Swiss soldiers, who were part of the rear guard. So, of course, I do collect rocks from battlefields. Wherever I have an example of a leader that does something or incredible initiative, or in this case, incredibly brave engineers and uh, innovation that did the bridge. So you gave me that um, privilege. A couple of impressions, and then I'll stop. Um, first, I was impressed with members, and, and I would be saying this even if Oleg was not sitting next to me. Um, he can bench press about 400 pounds, by the way, so I, <laughs> little, little, I'm being very <laughs> circumspect here. Um, um, everybody I met from the Minister of Foreign Affairs was like I was talking to somebody from Poland, Germany, France, UK, or, or whatever. I'm a very open, transparent um, not giving away the store, but I mean, you felt like, okay, let's talk. And then I had the chance to meet several people from the Ministry of Defense. I swear to God, I thought I was in the Kremlin. Uh, I, I spoke to one very senior officer. I said, hey, what do you think about maybe some officer exchanges or some of your officers would like to go to Army War College in Carlisle or National Defense University in Washington? He goes, no, we have plenty of schools. So, I mean, there was, it was completely different. And so that gives me pause um, that the completely different attitude that I got from a uh, ministry a defense official. And then, of course, even though there are no Russian soldiers living and stationed in uh, Belarus, there is infrastructure inside Belarus for logistics, fuel and, and maintenance, and things that could be used if a Russian force came through Belarus. Uh, and I, I don't know exa how extensive it is, but there is capability that there is, is specifically for that, and maybe Oleg can, can correct me on that. Uh, I'll, I'll close with um, opportunity. I think exercises are, are a great way. Whenever you get soldiers together, soldiers always figure things out. I mean, we had Russian troops with us when we went into Bosnia as part of the I-4. Soldiers always can always get along, can always figure things out. And we, we do a lot of exercises with Serbia. Actually, Serbia does more exercises with non-Russian countries than they do with with Russia, you just, it doesn't look that way, but the actual numbers are, that's the way it is. I would love to see us do something with, um, with Belarus, have troops from Belarus participate, and have a, American or other allied troops come to Belarus, and I'm talking about engineers, medical units, logistical units, platoon, company level, just to get it started. But also on things like Defender 20, the different, what separates a NATO exercise or an American exercise from what you see from the Russian Federation is the transparency. Um, Defender 20, yes, there'll be 40,000 uh, troops total from all over Europe, including 20,000 coming from the U.S. here in uh, May. But there'll probably be about 5,000 journalists crawling all over them as well, as well as observers uh, from other countries. That kind of uh, transparency, I think, helps um, reduce the anxiety about uh, um, what's going on. And the final uh, recommendation has to do with Ostrovets. Uh, I talked to a young man this morning who uh, is from Vilnius. I said, uh, I'm going to a panel uh, on Belarus. What, what do you think? And he said, oh, I'm very worried. I said, well, why are you, why are you so worried? I mean, explain to me. I, I barely passed electrical, electrical engineering when I was a cadet, so I don't understand how nuclear power actually works. Uh, I damn sure would not get in a submarine that's powered by it. But anyway, uh, I said, why, why are you so worried? He said, I'm, it's just a few miles from my hometown. If there's an accident in Ostrovets, my whole city will be destroyed. And this is a smart kid. He's in his fifth year at like Georgetown or in a, a program. Um, 
And I think the burden is on Belarus, because there's no doubt Ostrovitz is going to happen. I mean, it's, they're not going to at this point say, OK, you know, we, we changed our mind. So the burden is on Belarus to do things that earn confidence of their neighbor. But also, I think the European Union uh, should take this on on behalf of one of their members, Lithuania, and offer to Belarus uh, legions of observers, safety experts, um, to, to, to build confidence uh, of people that live within the, the potential danger zone of uh, Ostrovets um, to help build that confidence up. And, and I think this is, a, this is something that the EU, I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about visits, I'm talking about permanent people living there to uh, help make sure that Ostrovets runs safely. Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, that's a great kind of survey of uh, your experience with Belarus and the role of geography and also limitations in U.S. policy, uh, but also the opportunities that exist. So uh, we are going to now open the floor to questions and answers and, uh, and have a little bit of time here. So um, we shall get moving. I'll, I'll take the opportunity, the first question, uh, to Deputy Foreign Minister Kravchenko. Um, can you talk a little bit about your efforts to buy uh, American oil and uh, import American oil? And if um, George can possibly talk about U.S. views on that. To diversify your energy supply. There was a public statement by our president that we should be looking for alternative sources of uh, oil supply. So I understand that the bell nafta came which is responsible for that, has started to look into the options, not only here, but also elsewhere. And it is an ongoing process. And to tell the truth, I'm just uh, unaware of the details of, of this process. I was in Georgia when Bill Neftahim was here. So that would probably be, I guess, two weeks ago. Uh, when this conversation started this summer in advance of Russia once again showing that it's an unreliable energy partner, uh, in this case the dirty oil that uh, gummed up the Belarusian refinery, following on the tr fine tradition of Gazprom turning off the gas across Ukraine even though they have contracts. Um, uh, this issue came up, uh, uh, Belarusian officials have raised it with us both here and in Minsk. Uh, my response when raised to me is, Sounds great. Go talk to companies. Uh, we, the U.S. government doesn't sell oil. Uh, what the U.S. government does do is uh, <laughs> sanction certain companies, including Bell Neftahim, but we have a system of waivers. And as part of the step-by-step uh, -step approach to uh, expanding the possibilities of relationships, uh, the waivers that were granted initially on a six-month basis, last year we shifted to a 12-month basis. And when they were renewed, uh, the waiver licenses by Treasury last month, it shifted to 18 months. So that's the regulatory, um, uh, if you will, influence to allow companies that may reach a contractual uh, agreement uh, with Bell Neftahim, gives them more space to sign contracts and, and, and seek financing for the deals. But uh, when uh, Under Secretary Hale and I were in uh, Minsk uh, in mid-September, uh, the previous delegation, which had been there the day before, was the Crown Prince of uh, UAE, and I believe President Lukashenko made a counterpart visit um, uh, to UAE recently, and I don't think it's a shared mutual interest in falconry. <laughs> so, I, I think, so I think that's a, a sign, again, you know, it's, oil is a commodity, it's a market, obviously, a pipe uh, from Russia is the infrastructure that's quickest, closest, and cheapest, but I think uh, diversity in sources of energy is wise for every country, and that includes Belarus. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir, question here, and then we'll uh, come flop this side. So, uh, microphone, and please identify yourself. Uh, Andre Laron of Kate Institute. Uh, may I ask you a question? I'm a little bit puzzled. Uh, neither this session nor uh, the first session never has been mentioned the concept of the historic Russia. Uh, the concept of Russian world has been mentioned several times, but the concept of historic Russia then has been uh, promoted by President Putin on his Victory Day speech uh, uh, on May 9th, uh, year 2019 in Moscow, uh, has never been uh, mentioned even. Uh, and according to the definition that uh, President Putin has given to the historic Russia, 
In his article of year 2012, Historic Russia is the Territory of the Russian Empire at the end of 18th century, which by definition includes uh, Belarus in full and most part of Ukraine in Historic Russia. So I would be glad to hear from the distinguished panelists uh, your comments about this particular uh, novelty in the diplomatic language from Moscow. When I was traveling through uh, Brussels about 10 years ago, I bought a very nice map. Uh, I believe it was from a French uh, atlas or a book, uh, and uh, it dates from roughly 1585. Kiev is a city in the Lithuanian uh, Grand Duchy, and Muscovy is Muscovy. So <laughs> I, I think, um, and the Genovese still controlled the south bank of Crimea. Uh, and the Genovese controlled the South Bank of Crimea longer than the Russians have. So I think uh, lots of people have lots of different versions of history. Uh, and I would say that uh, I think Ben Hodges was talking about Zesh Pospolita. And I think there's plenty of room for the Lithuanians, Poles, and Belarusians to celebrate their common heritage. That didn't matter. No one has anything? Uh, listen, we had some questions here on the... Okay, very briefly. I mean, there are several forms of our cooperation with Russia. Um, obviously, um, the, the Union State, so-called Union State, and the Eurasian Economic Union. And since I'm, I mean, my portfolio does not include Belarus and Russian relations, of course, I hear something. But it is not my sense that this concept is being um, used, applied, promoted within the bilateral Belarusian-Russian uh, relationship. So this is my sense that this is not a part of, of our uh, really multifaceted and complex conversations. OK, the, you gentlemen here on the uh, right here, and then we'll go to the back. My, my question is to George Kent, very briefly, and, and, and actually I would appreciate as exact reply as you can give, uh, what would need to happen in Belarus for you to scrap the economic sanctions against Bill Nifty him? Uh, the U.S. government has an interagency uh, policy process, uh, and so it's a matter of the entire U.S. government getting together and discussing. Uh, State Department, the organization I represent, doesn't control sanction policy. That's actually our Treasury de uh, um, uh, Department. Or, uh, so I guess what I would say is, as I tried to suggest, that um, the sanctions that were imposed, both individually and on companies, came out of the Belarus Democracy Act. And so it's, uh, I think, specific concerns um, within the framework of what has happened over the, the past 10 plus years. And I think that what I mentioned before about opening up more space for civil uh, society, civil actors, and alternative views of politics would be the basis for us to go and have an interagency conversation in consultation with Congress, which passed the law, to describe how much more space we might be able to create uh, as we look to move forward. But there's not an ability to describe a precise answer, um, uh, but I think uh, steps, positive steps in an opening up space uh, would give us the rationale to start that interagency discussion to see if we could possibly uh, lift uh, the sanctions, not just granting waivers and licenses for short term, but having a, a longer term relief and, and change of our policy. Thank you. My name is Kastas. I'm from the Ambus of Lithuania. Thank you for a very interesting panel discussion. Uh, I would like to appreciate uh, General Ben Goji Hodges uh, uh, talking about Astrovets. Uh, very broad topic. I'll not go into it, but uh, I'll double down on what you said. Also about Kosciuszko heritage, and not just Kosciuszko, but also Kalinovsky, as Franak Vechorka yesterday said during the Helsinki Commission hearing. And really, it's much to celebrate and much to, to have in common, which probably leads to, to the question to Vice Minister Oleg Kravchenko. Uh, also appreciate that you showed this openness and eagerness to develop relations with uh, European Union, closer relations, but what the official Minsk is ready to do so those relations are going really moving forward. Thank you. Yeah. 
of course, it is a very big uh, question to try to answer. Uh, briefly, we have a coordination group between Belarus and the EU, which meets annually twice uh, a year, and we discuss all these potential steps from both sides. And I mean, it is from one point of view a long list of steps that we discuss uh, to be taken by both sides from, from the other side. I mean, uh, it is the, as I said, the visa facilitation and readmission agreement that is practically ready to be signed. Then again, I think that uh, we should start negotiating the partnership and cooperation agreement, uh, which uh, lacks, unfortunately, from these um, set of treaties between the EU and neighboring countries. Um, what are we ready to do? I mean, I think we have demonstrated our desire to improve this relationship. Again, I'm pretty straightforward when I say that we do not think that all the demands and requirements that may be applied to candidates or aspirants to become a part of this exclusive club, being the EU, should not be necessarily applied to a neighbor in order for us to be good neighbors, predictable neighbors, helping each other, not creating troubles for each other, uh, having a normal trade relationship within the uh, future, I believe, partnership and cooperation agreement. Um, so again, it is a bilateral process, a two-way street, and I mean, in order to understand what, in the context of your question, what do we have to do, maybe I should also ask you back, um, what do you think we should do? Because it is a little bit unexpected uh, question, I mean, what do we have to do? Is there, is there a set of requirements for us to, again, work with our immediate neighbor with which we have been working for years? Uh, there was, of course, a very uh, troublesome period in our relations It is behind us. We still have differences, as allies do even, and we are yet to reach even the stage of a normalized relationship, uh, let alone a status of allies. So if you want me to elaborate on that, then I would, I would think I would ask you to specify the question. But I think it is an ongoing process. There is desire on both sides to improve the relationship. We're working on that. It's, again, it's not without difficulties. There will be bumps on the road, but I think that strategically in the long term, the perspective is positive. There's a question in the back, uh, sir. And then uh, next, we'll go to you, Yanish, after that. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for, for your comments today and for uh, enlightening us more about Belarus and its current uh, state. Uh, my name is Arthur Pichatowski, and I kind of want to join a question, a question that came up during the academic panel earlier and kind of bring it into this discussion uh, right now, is uh, after the Soviet narrative, right, there's a period of time where different types of narratives are created because you simply have time to realize that these other historical facts also took place somewhere along the way. And in the previous panel, there was a discussion about two narratives, one which is the, uh, which is the historical narrative of this great Lithuanian duchy, and the second narrative, the one of uh, affinity with Russia in terms of uh, Belarusian society. Um, so I, I think my question kind of is, to what extent is that uh, important to Belarusian leadership, this kind of responsibility for this strong history? Because something which really comes out in Belarusians when you visit Belarus is like people who have literally lived through everything, right? Nothing will, nothing will, nothing new can surprise them, right? A toughness that comes from the character of Belarusians. So my question is, is, is how seriously is that historical narrative, that historical background, taken in terms of right developing and cultivating that in terms of uh, the Belarusian leadership? I think it would be a little bit too simplistic to be surprised of us recognizing in our own history um, different facts that may be seen from the current point of view using the current narratives as contradictory. Again, I usually speak about the counterproductive and false choice between the East and the West. Uh, where we are 
geographically, geopolitically, historically, we have been influenced by the East, by the West. We have been a part of different states, different uh, combinations of states, so to speak. So, of course, there are different parts in our history which, in my view, do not necessarily have to be seen as contradictory. And I would be definitely <laughs> against trying to erase some of the parts of our history. Um, history is important for international relations at the same time. In my view, history may also have a destructive potential for international relations if recalled too early and explored too early because some historic wounds can be revived, so to speak, and used if the intent, uh, if there is an intent to, to spoil the relationship. But again, why not recognize that we have had historically good relations, sometimes conflicts with different countries in the East, in the West, and these should be a part of our history, again, without necessarily contradicting to each other. Janusz. Yeah. Oleg, I have another question for you. Take the opportunity that you're here. You mentioned in your introductory remarks about Minsk being open to closer relations with NATO. I think you even mentioned a cooperation agreement of sorts. How would you envisage that? What steps need to be taken to reach that agreement, to, to make that? Presume you're talking about bilateral agreement with NATO, not individual countries. Could you sort of develop that a little bit? Before he responds, I'd like to point out to you that Kyrgyzstan has Russian military bases, air bases, and Kyrgyzstan has closer relations with NATO than Belarus does. And that is a debate going on in NATO now, which astounds people when you talk about this. I mean, I mean, you're next to Poland and you can't, what, the relations with NATO are not on the level of Kyrgyzstan? I mean, come on. But there are other countries blocking this. And you have to ask is whose interest is this for us to isolate Belarus and just, I mean, so Kyrgyzstan can have better relations with, you know, I mean, it just doesn't make sense geopolitically. Anyway, I'll let him. It is not some kind of full, full-fledged uh, agreement on cooperation between Belarus and the NATO that would allegedly or potentially lead to a closer relationship. It is a rather technical agreement which is needed in order to cooperate in, in many spheres, but also spheres that do not have any strategic character. It is an agreement, the law name is on protection or ensuring confidentiality of information that NATO and Belarus would be sharing. And without this agreement, apparently many absolutely apolitical spheres of cooperation between us are impossible, like participation in joint exercises on emergency preparedness. Again, not something that would be potentially seen as us trying to improve the relationship with the NATO, opposing to our relationship with Russia, which we don't want to do. So again, it's very low level, very technical level agreement that we signed in 1995. And it was not certified for political reasons. Again, not to try to judge or discuss the political reasons that were behind that, but the times have changed, and I believe it is time to certify this agreement and to start implementing all these 19 Again, still very modest uh, priorities of our cooperation that we have agreed on. And if I can just add, I, I believe uh, we've got representatives from three of the countries that uh, had reservations in the past, and I think the next time there's a regular meeting, uh, it is likely that uh, um, those three countries will uh, express their willingness to be supportive and move forward. It's not just uh, Kyrgyzstan, it includes Russia itself, which has that basic uh, agreement. So I, I think we're on the path to uh, resolution, um, uh, and I don't know what the, the schedule of the regularly scheduled meeting is, but I think that uh, will be coming up in the, in the coming months. Thank you. You had a question, uh, Jar? Hi, uh, Deborah Kagan. Um, so a question for both uh, for both uh, Mr. Kent and for the minister. Why now? 
there has been a spate of uh, hectic movement about restoring some relationship with Belarus. Is this motivated because of what happened in Ukraine? Why now for both sides? Why do you think now is a good opportunity to do this? I think the uh, if uh, the approach uh, towards U.S. Belarusians from the U.S. side uh, dates back to last year. Uh, Wes Mitchell is the one who, as I said, wrote uh, the European portion of the national security strategy and then uh, conceptualized, uh, framed out uh, the approach to uh, moving forward with Belarus. And uh, it was referenced before his, his visit uh, last uh, October 31st, November 1st of 2018. Uh, which had been the highest visit of a U.S. diplomat for a decade. Um, and so, uh, again, it's, it's a, a slow, uh, deliberative process, but it's very much moving forward on a track. And I, I think it, it was a point in time, 2018, that did come four years after uh, Russia's uh, occupation of Crimea and, and war in eastern uh, Ukraine, and I believe that from our many conversations with President Lukashenko over the last four or five years, it did fundamentally change his understanding of the nature of Russian power and uh, changed his own calculus. And so that, uh, going back, uh, we did not withdraw our ambassador in 2008. We did not reduce our diplomatic staff. Our ambassador was ordered out, and our staff was reduced from about 35 to 5. Um, and so we have been, it's been a long path back to uh, reaching normalization, but I think uh, uh, obviously both countries had reached the point where uh, that was uh, deemed in mutual interest. And so we've been taking steps, measured steps forward over the past year. But I'll let Dolik uh, describe from the Belarusian. But I, I do think there was a commonality of interest uh, to move forward. And I agree with that. And I also would like to say that I don't think that there was a specific reason or trigger for us to normalize the relationship now. Um, it's more about the depth of the diplomatic conflict back in, back in 2007, 2008, when we were uh, on the brink of breaking the diplomatic relations. Uh, when the relation, when the ambassadors had to leave, when the majority of diplomats had to leave. And this decision, you're right, it was our decision, but it was a decision in response to sanctions imposed by the U.S. on Belarus. So it was, again, it's not to try to understand who started what, but there was a very unfortunate diplomatic conflict. And again, it was a very serious conflict, and it took us that much time to not even fully normalize the relationship, not even still be able to return to, I don't know, 2007, 2006, uh, to return to normalcy in our relationship. And I recall I was here as uh, a counselor at the embassy when the diplomatic conflict uh, started. And I recalled it very vividly that when the ambassadors had to leave, it was March, and I received a call from Minsk saying, don't you worry, you'll get your ambassador back before cherry blossom, which is usually in April. It was 2008. So this is, I think, a lesson for everyone that destroying relationship is easy. Restoring the relationship may take more than a decade. It's very difficult. I would also point out, too, that uh, Belarus's decision not to, uh, to reject Russian announcements of uh, establishing an, an air base, uh, not once but several times, uh, woke some people up geopolitically to the importance of Belarus. And actually, when Mike Carpenter uh, went to Belarus on his first visit, I asked him what, he, what, what caused people to t turn their attention around, and he said, it's because they started looking at maps. And so... <laughs> Um, we got about five minutes left. Uh, I'll take a group of questions if you have it, and then we'll uh, conclude and let these uh, gentlemen go on to their busy days. No? No comments? Going once. Ben, I would like to ask a question. What would be the uh, impact of Russian ground troops on NATO planning? In based permanently in Belarus. Thought you were going to ask my favorite gin, which is what I <laughs> in my head I already heard a transition that you were what, fixing. What would, I thought you were going to ask Army 
Army Navy. Yeah, well, that's coming. Uh, our Army team, four in a row. Um, well, obviously, the, the, the biggest challenge would be now you've got significantly different time-space factors. I mean, every Estonian can tell you exactly how long it takes to fly a helicopter from Pishkov into somewhere in Estonia. So they, they've already done that math. But if you're down in Lithuania or Poland, it's, it's a significantly different and more favorable time and space factor before um, Russian ground troops could, could be entering the Sawaki Corridor area, for example. Um, the other, the other part of this, of course, is about uh, during. My biggest fear was always that during an exercise, that the exercise was going to turn into something else. That there would be a big Zapad type exercise going on um, in Belarus or in the, somewhere in the Western Military District, where you've got everybody there, units are filled out, they're at a high level of readiness, and then it transitions into an actual uh, use of force. Um, if, if they're not based in Belarus, it's a little bit more difficult to be able to pull that off. So that reduces, that reduces the threat. The other part, of course, we, we talk about Swalky Corridor. The reason it's a corridor is because of the, the two national boundaries on both sides, Kaliningrad and, and Belarus. It's not a corridor because of topography. If... Um, if Belarus is able to uh, maintain uh, some degree of, of, uh, of independence and there are no Russian ground troops based there, then the Suwalki Corridor is actually a much larger uh, sort of construct. Uh, and that, and that, that's a better, that's a better um, problem to have to worry about than one where it's this 60 mile wide that only has one railroad and, and, uh, and one good road going through it. Uh, and then finally, um, the, uh, it's about Ukraine. Um, Ukraine is in a fight with Russia. Um, Ukrainian soldiers are getting killed every week still, years after a so-called ceasefire was implemented. So nobody should trust the Kremlin and, uh, unless you've got real strong enforcement and the OSCE has never been allowed to do their job in Donbass because of Russia. So Ukraine cannot afford, does not have the capacity to have a lot of troops sitting on their border with Belarus, worried about Russia attacking there in the western part of the country, given what they're having to deal with in the east. So um, I think that uh, it, it helps in the strategic calculations of Ukraine as well, as long as Belarus, and Belarus is not responsible for guarding Ukraine's flank, with the absence of Russian troops there, uh, that's a positive. And I suspect, uh, I suspect that uh, Belarus looks at Ukraine um, as, hey, stay in the fight, keep doing what you're doing, hang in there, um, because that makes it much more difficult for Russia to simultaneously launch, uh, attempt an Anschluss and Belarus as well, if they're if they're toe to toe uh, in the Donbass and, and so many resources committed uh, in Crimea. So what you're well. saying is Russian troops are kind of tied down in Donbass a little yes, bit. Yes, absolutely. And it's it's not just the what I imagine are four or five thousand mostly officers and, and uh, technical uh, experts. Um, I mean Russia. The Russian military is still a conscript army. It's, it's more and more professional, but still over 50% they're conscripts. So they have the, the, the conscript waves where they all load up for a period of time. And, and so um, it's, it's to everybody's advantage, including Belarus, um, that there are no Russian ground troops there. It's, it's a different calculation. Okay. Uh, we've got to end, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, have got a busy day ahead of them and we thank you for your time here and if you have another question please grab them on the side and we're going to adjourn for a 15 minute coffee break and begin the second panel Happy Thanksgiving.